Psalm 133, a psalm that is probably familiar to most of us, a psalm speaking about the goodness and pleasantness of unity, of brothers dwelling together in unity, which will be the theme of our sermon this evening from Ephesians chapter 4, the blessed unity that we have with our God through Christ. Well, this unity in Psalm 133, it's a blessing. He compares it to the oil running down from Aaron's beard, the high priest who ministers on our behalf. The oil is a sign of the spirit that we receive through the high priest. As the Lord Jesus Christ on high, he poured out his spirit upon us, the refreshment of the oil or the dew from Mount Hermon. As it falls upon the ground, it it gives life, it gives refreshment. That's what it is to dwell in the presence of God, to dwell together in unity. We're encouraged by it, renewed by it, refreshed by the Spirit of God working together through His people. We pray this evening as we know that unity together, may that be true. May we truly indeed be refreshed And say with the psalmist how good and pleasant it is. Let's hear then the word of the Lord. A song of a sense of David. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard. On the beard of Aaron. Running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Amen. And God bless the the reading of his word. With me this evening to Ephesians chapter 4, as we hear the very word of God. Our passage this evening is Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6 considering this gospel unity, the unity that we have in the gospel that exhorts us to to maintain this unity, to keep the unity that we have in Christ. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. May God bless the reading and now the preaching of his holy word. What is the worthy life? How is it that we would live worthily before God? Well, worth can be defined as that quality or thing that leads to its importance or its value, or its merit. It is, it is worthy. The thing that's held in high esteem. The, the philosophers of a day gone by, they held that the worthy life was in contemplating the good. The worth was found in the mind, in contemplating God or, or the things of God. Others thought it wasn't in the mind or contemplation, that the worthy life was in action. The things that we do, that's what made it worthy if we were being active in doing good. For others, and we see this in our day, a worthy life is a life of pleasure. Eat, drink, and be merry. Fill yourself up with all of your desires. That's what life is about. That is the worthy life. The worthy life is finding your own identity. That's what we're told this day. It's finding whoever you are. Whatever you believe yourself to be, you do that. Do you. It's found in the individual, free from all constraints. How do you view the worthy life? Well, that's what confronts us here this evening. 
a life worthy of the gospel. Paul exhorts us here in verse 1. He urges us, beseeches us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. He says something similar in 1 Thessalonians 1. We are to live a life worthy of God. Colossians 1, live a life worthy of the Lord. In the book of Philippians, to live a life worthy of the gospel. In other words, there is a worthy life. We don't have to surmise what that might be. We come to hear it in the very word of God. There is a life that is worthy and a life that's unworthy. So at times in Paul's epistles and letters, he speaks about living contrary to that worthy life. Living contrary to sound doctrine, he says, that's not in accordance with the glory of the gospel of the blessed God. That living in a manner of disunity or selfish ambition, self-righteousness, living according to the lusts and pride of men, these are things that are not worthy of Christ or his kingdom. In fact, our life is to match the worthiness of the message we believe. That if we believe the gospel and the worth of the gospel itself, that our life is to match the worth of the gospel we believe. Therefore, it's not only what we believe that matters, it's how we live. Are we living in accordance with what we believe? And these things always go hand in hand. Faith and practice. Doctrine and piety. Our confession of faith and how we live out that faith. Are we living worthy of the gospel? People in our culture, they want to know what to do without knowing what they're supposed to believe. Just tell me what to do. Just give me the plan. Give me a self-help book. I want to live well without understanding what I'm supposed to believe. But our theology always leads to practice, and our practice flows out of our theology. Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So based upon who you are in your heart, it will lead to action, it will lead to speech, it will lead to what we do. Theology and practice, they go together. This is what you have in the book of Ephesians. You have it in many of Paul's letters, but it's so clear here in the book of Ephesians. For the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, Paul's been hammering out what we are to believe. He's speaking of the glorious gospel of God. Chapter 1, he speaks about all of the blessings that we have in Christ. Chapter 2, he speaks of this saving grace of the gospel. We were dead, and yet we've been made alive together with Christ. Jews and Gentiles have been brought together as one. In chapter 3, he speaks of the unsearchable riches of Christ that are made known to both Jews and Gentiles. That we have received these riches through the gospel. But after speaking about three chapters of what we are to believe. Three chapters of what God has done for us in Christ. Now you come in chapter 4 to really the first imperative, the first command, what we are to do. Because what we are to do, how we are to live, is to be grounded in what we believe. So therefore, he says, Therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk worthy of the gospel. In light of all that God has done for us, we are to live a certain way. Brothers and sisters, the gospel, the good news of what Christ has done, is to reorder our lives back to God. That if we have believed the truth of the gospel, now we are to live a life that's in accordance with the gospel. That the power of Christ by his spirit enables us to live a certain way before God. And that's what you see in the second half of the book of Ephesians, starting with what we see here in Ephesians 4, that a worthy life is a life united together in Christ. Well, let's think about this worthy life then a little more. We're going to see this under three points. First, the worthy life is a called 
life. It's a called life. That we have been called by the Spirit of God. We are to walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called. To be a Christian is to be someone who's been called. We not only receive the general call of the gospel, the gospel goes out to all. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. We've heard the gospel. But a Christian is one who's been effectually called by the Spirit. That the Spirit of God has enlightened our minds to believe those truths. It's, it's renewed our wills to now embrace Christ freely in the gospel. We've been irresistibly called by God. Just as God called Abraham out of Ur, out of the world, out of idolatry, to now follow him and believe in the promises. We too have been called by God. Sovereignly, graciously called by his Spirit. To now come to Christ and to follow him. To turn from all of our idolatry. Now to walk worthy of the Lord. Therefore he beseeches us to walk worthy of our calling to which we have been called. What is the foundation though for this walking worthy? It's the fact that you've been called. Because we've been called by God, we've been called by God, by His grace, to live a certain way, to walk a certain way. That the profound truths of the gospel and His grace are the foundation for godly living. In other words, it's not just about you know, how we do things or having a book on five steps to a better life. You could come here and just say, this is how we're supposed to live. But at the end of the day, that's just moralism. Right? It's giving you just the law of God, that's legalism. Right? It gives you no power. Just by telling you what to do gives you no power to actually do it. We need the law. We need to be told what is the worthy life, but we need the power to do it, which comes from the gospel. It comes from what God has done. He's called us. And because he's called us, now we are to live. He gives us the grace and freedom to live before God. And so, it's the sound theology that leads to sound living. Jonathan Edwards, a great American Puritan, he says that all theology is application, and all application is theology. Meaning that true theology is to lead us to a right life, it's to be applied. And if it is true and sound application, it is also theological. It's rooted and grounded in God. And so theology is not just about filling our hearts and minds with, with great intellectual thoughts. It's about understanding who God is and what he's done so that it would lead to a life now of love to God, love for our neighbor. That theology would truly transform us. And so how we live is founded upon the great truths of the gospel. Think of the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 12, again, a passage you would know. In, Ephesians, or in Romans chapter 12, after 11 chapters in the book of Romans, Paul's been laying out glorious truths of the gospel. We've been justified by faith alone. We are sanctified by the Spirit of God. We've been sovereignly and graciously elected and called by His mercy. And then he gets to chapter 12. And he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 11 chapters of laying out what God has done for us in Christ. He says, therefore, live a certain way. In light of the mercy of God, in light of God's mercy in Christ, now I beseech you to give your whole life a spiritual worship. That's what he's saying here in Ephesians 4. If we have truly believed the wonderful, unsearchable riches of Christ, if you've received his mercy, therefore, walk in a manner that's worthy of what you have believed. See, we only walk worthy of the gospel because we've been called by Christ. 
Paul says this in verse 18 of chapter 1. He prays for us that we may know the hope to which he has called you. Or in chapter 2 and verse 4, he says, We were dead in our trespasses, but God, out of his love, made you alive together with Christ. He says he called you. He made you alive. He called you to himself. Here in chapter 4, he tells us in verse 6, or in verse, excuse me, verse 4, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. A Christian is one who's been sovereignly called, called out of sin and death, out of the world, to now walk, to now walk with the Lord. Just as Abraham did, he walked with the Lord. He walked before him. He had his whole lifestyle changed. So this walking worthily is our whole course of our life. Christians aren't those who just come on Sundays. We have one day that we give to the Lord. And then we go live however we want to the rest of the day. No, we've been called out of the world to come give our whole life to God. It's a lifestyle. It's given our whole life as a spiritual act of worship to God. We've been called to walk with the Lord. That's what the gospel does. It reorders our life back to God. Or as one theologian put it, he says there's not one nook or cranny of the redeemed self that the triune God does not make new. So if you've been called, you've been made new, you're a new creation. And every part of you, your mind, your heart, your will, it's all been renewed, reordered to God so that you could walk worthy before him. And so, brothers and sisters, we're called to live our whole life according to the gospel we confess. We confess we've been called by God, therefore we're to live a certain way before God, the worthy life. Is your life characterized by the gospel? Or do we just give lip service to it? Do we confess one thing and then live another way? No, as God's people, what we confess is the foundation for our life. We have a new calling, a new, a new vocation. What is that vocation, that calling? It's to live as faithful Christians before God, living a worthy life. And so we could tell others in the world, there is a worthy life not seeking your own pleasure, not just in contemplation or action. The worthy life is found in Christ who reorders your life back to God to live for him. That is a worthy life. It's a called life. One who has now this new vocation, life in Christ. But as we see in Ephesians 4, this calling is not just for individuals. It's a life together. One way in which we walk worthy of our calling is walking in unity together as the church. So secondly, the worthy life is to live in complete unity. We have a called life, and now we are to live in complete unity. This is what Paul is exhorting the church to do. In verse 3, that we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. He gives an exhortation to us that we must maintain this unity. But what is the basis or foundation of his calling? I said that the, the commands of God are always founded in what God has done for us. Well, we see this in verse 4. He gives the basis for his plea to maintain unity. It's the fact that we have already been united. We already have a true unity through Christ and the gospel. And since we have been united as God's people, we are to maintain that unity. We are to keep that unity because we already have it. It is already a reality. And you could say, well, the church at times looks so disunified. We see so much discord and disunity, not only in the world, but in the church. How is the church unified? The church is unified through the gospel we profess. Though it's not always manifest in the world, 
Though our sin can blur the reality that we have in Christ, we have to see as Christians, we are one. We are one. At times we won't manifest it, but it is a reality for us in the gospel. But because we already have it, this is what makes sin so so horrendous. Sin in churches, sin that's not dealt with, goes unchecked or unhindered in its pastors or its members, can really destroy the unity of a church. Right? We see this in the world. You see this in politics all around. We're so disunifying. Not only here, you look at it in America as well. You see families torn apart from sin, relationships shattered, churches disrupted because of sin. Sin that brings disunity. And so Paul is telling us that we must be zealous to maintain the unity that we have in Christ so that we would manifest this unity to the world. How do churches tend to deal with this, to seek this unity? Well, times they seek to deal with unity by compromising the truth of the gospel. Right? Many churches, in order to overcome divisions in the church, they do so at the expense of truth. That it's thought that unity is greater than truth. But Paul's point is that unity is in the truth. That unity is founded upon the gospel we profess. The one triune God who has saved us and called us. The one faith that has granted to us this one hope. And he joined us as one body. Unity, to be true biblical unity, is a unity in truth. As we're united to God. R.C. Sproul said, Unity for the sake of visible oneness alone is not pleasing to God. As the Apostle Paul demonstrates here, there could be no compromise when the gospel of God is at stake. It's the gospel that unifies us. So we need to know what we believe if we're going to have true unity that's founded upon the truth. Well, Paul gives us here a perfect unity. If you go through the list here, he gives us seven commonalities that we have, seven being the number of perfection, completeness. It's not arbitrary. He's telling us we have a complete and perfect unity in God, a unity we didn't create. He's not saying something that the Ephesians somehow mustered up enough unity in the church. He said this unity is from above. It's from God through his spirit who has created this unity. It's the unity that Jesus prayed for in John 17, that we would be one, even as the Father and Him are one. That the church's oneness is to reflect the nature of our God. Well, let's consider then these, some of these commonalities, this unity that we have in God. Firstly, our unity is in the Trinity. It's in the triune God. Our God is one in three, three in one, a tri-unity. The Father, Son, and Spirit, they are all equally God. They share in one essence, and yet there's a diversity of persons. Therefore, the church, not because we are united in one essence, but the church is to reflect the unity of God. There is a great diversity in the church, And yet we are united in one in the Lord. Well, Paul speaks of all three persons here. He speaks of the Spirit. There is only one Spirit. For the Spirit is the one who brings about this unity. And so we could only have unity if we have the indwelling Spirit of God. He is the one who binds us together as a church, as the body of Christ. And as he brings us to Christ, we now share in unity in the Godhead. But our unity is also in the Lord. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one mediator, one Savior, one Lord. And so through faith in the gospel, we've come under the Lordship of Christ. We now confess Jesus is Lord. And because there is only one Lord, all who confess his name, who have faith in Christ, we are one. 
one in Christ, united to him. And through Christ, we come to the one Father. He says there is only one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. That is, all of his creation, all of those Jews and Gentiles who united together in one. He is the Father of all his people who are gathered in Christ. And so as we come to faith in Christ, we have been united to the triune God. So Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.18, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And there is only one God. Though the Gentile pagans in Ephesus, they would declare in the multiplicity of gods, just like our culture does, believe in any God you want. There's all the same. It doesn't matter. There's many gods, many ways to salvation. No, as Christians, we proclaim the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is one God, one Father, one Lord Jesus Christ who has united us together. And so our unity is a unity in God. But there is also a unity, we would say, in the church, what we can call a ecclesiastical oneness. Paul speaks about there being one body, one baptism, and one faith. That there's only one body. This is the one universal body of Christ, what we would call the universal church. That everyone throughout the world who believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, they are united to this universal body. All the elects in heaven above and on earth below are united to Christ. We are his body. That's an encouragement for us. As we gather here this evening, though we are few, we gather in the very presence of God with all of those, Corinthians tells us, with all of those who call upon the name of the Lord. So we are connected with all of those who worship the one true and living God through Christ. One body. And at that last day, when we are gathered to the Lord, there will truly be one body. No more, no, no more division, no more disunity, no more denominations as such. We'll be gathered together through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we manifest this unity in our baptism, that we are to give a visible expression to our faith that we profess by being joined to the body of Christ. In other words, it's not enough just to say, I belong to the universal church. Paul also speaks about baptism. Being joined to the church through baptism to give a visible expression of our faith in Christ. We've been baptized in the one name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so our baptisms are testimony of our salvation in Christ, and they display the oneness that we have. There's not many baptisms. There's one true baptism. Baptism in the name of our triune God through faith in Christ. And there also is this unity in the faith. As we gather as his church, we gather according to the truth that we profess. It's not just a, a oneness in activity. It's not a, a oneness in social action. Right? We as individual Christians can gather with many people in the society to do great action, great work, good work. But the unity that Paul speaks about is not just a unity in the work that we do. He says it's a unity in what we believe. There is one faith, which Jude 3 says it's the faith that's been once for all handed down to the saints. One body of doctrine, one glorious gospel that we confess. All true unity is a unity in the faith. And therefore, as Christ's church, we must not compromise the gospel. For therefore, we would lose all unity. We stand firm upon the word of God and what we believe so that we would be united together with all of those who profess this same faith. And finally here, this unity we could call an expectant unity. 
It's a unity that grants to us this hope. There is one hope, the hope of our calling. We have this glorious hope that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to appear. He's coming again to gather his church to himself. And on that day, all sin and sorrow will be put away. All divisions will be done away with. And we will be gathered together in the presence of our Savior. It is an expectant hope of glory. When this perfect and complete unity will be consummated from all different backgrounds, different nations and tongues, gathered together around the throne of Christ, perfectly one. In this age, sin can disrupt this unity. We know this, we've experienced it in churches, we've experienced it in society. There is coming a day when all of that will be put away. For we share one hope of the glorious coming of our Savior. And so, brothers and sisters, Paul wants us, the Lord wants us to see we have been united together. We have a perfect unity in the gospel. This is a reality. This is the truth. And because of this reality, this oneness, now he exhorts us to live a certain way. We must maintain it and keep it and seek to express this unity in the world. Which comes then to our third and final point, that the worthy life is to be lived out in Christ-like virtues. That is, how are we to live, live out this perfect unity? How are we to live a life worthy of our calling? We are to have Christ-like virtues. We're to be like Christ, renewed in His image. You can see this in verse 2. How are we to live a worthy life, a life of unity? He says, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Paul exhorts us to be like Christ. He exhorts us to be marked by humility. If we're going to maintain unity in the church, we must humble ourselves. We are called to honor others above ourselves, to think more highly of others than ourselves. We're to have the mind of Christ in Philippians chapter 2. He says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he humbled himself by becoming a servant. If the eternal Son of God, our Lord, humbled himself by becoming a servant, how much more should we humble ourselves and give ourselves for the good of the church? If we're only seeking to push our own agendas and our own ideas in the church, then it'll destroy it. Our pride will destroy the church, destroys that unity. But if we humble ourselves, seeking the good of the others, then we will demonstrate and manifest this unity amongst us. We need to humbly admit when we are wrong. Humbly seek forgiveness from our brothers and sisters. Humbly allow others to be heard and for others' gifts to flourish. We need to be like Christ if we are to maintain this unity. But we also need this gentleness. This doesn't come easy for us, especially when we seek to have great convictions of truth. But as great as our convictions of the truth are, we need to hold those convictions and speak of these convictions gently. Paul tells this of pastors who preach the word. 1 Timothy 4, preach the word of God in season and out of season and do so with all gentleness. How many times have we spoken the truth with others and yet we did so in a harsh manner? We knew we were right. We knew we were standing upon the word of God. And yet we didn't express Christ-like virtues. And therefore, all it did was end in more disunity. Jesus in Matthew 11 is the one who is gentle and lowly. And we need to be like him. We need to be like our God through Christ who was patient with us. A long-suffering God. We deserve his judgment, yet God was patient with us. 
And we need to deal patiently with one another. We have to realize that not everyone in the church is in the same place as we are. That there's different levels of sanctification. Different levels of knowledge and wisdom and holiness. We want others to be, well, you don't, why don't you see this? Why aren't you where I am? Well, by God's grace, it's taken you some time to get there. So be patient with our brothers and sisters. Patience doesn't mean overlooking sin. It means bearing with one another in love, as our God has done for us. It means actually bearing with them. That when we join a church, we're committing ourselves to the good of that particular body, the body of Christ. And things don't happen overnight. Committing to one another is not just for a week or a moment. It's committing to work hard and labor for their good. Galatians 6.2, bear with one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what church membership is about. Bearing with one another in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. It's not just a matter of having deep affections for them. Saying, oh, I love them. It does come with affections. Our affections grow over time. It's about being committed to them, sacrificially giving ourselves for the good of our brothers and sisters. That's what love is. God's commitment to us, his covenantal steadfast love granted in Christ, his seeking our good out of the fullness of himself, his love. And so unity is destroyed when we lack this love. If we are to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, we must love one another as Christ has loved us. Each of us have been loved by Christ, and therefore we're to express that love to one another in all unity. Again, this is why we need to be like Christ. Paul will tell us that in Ephesians 5 that we are being renewed into his image, restored back into his image. We've been reordered back to God so that we would have this humility, gentleness, patience, and love. And that we would continue to do so, though imperfectly, in this life until it's perfect in glory. Why is there so much disunity in churches? It's because it, churches lack this love. They lack a true understanding of the gospel they profess because it's not demonstrated in love. It's because of pride that destroys the church, unwilling to humble themselves the way the Son of God did with his dying love for us. And so if we grasp that which God has called us to, if we truly understand the gospel we profess, then we will be a certain kind of person. The Spirit of God will make us like Christ to have these Christ-like virtues. Then and only then will we be able to zealously maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And so, brothers and sisters, let us seek to do so, zealously maintaining this unity in love for one another. Unity in this congregation, absolutely, that is needed. And also unity with other churches, unity with other Christians that we have been bound to, that we must do every effort as Christians to display this unity in truth and the gospel we proclaim. What is the worthy life? It is a life together in Christ. It is a life by which we have been called out of the world to now be united to Christ, to live in him and for him. And we do so together as the church. It's a life of unity with brothers and sisters in Christ seeking to glorify our great gods. The gospel we profess leads to a worthy life of living for God. May he be glorified as we live this worthy life for him. Amen. Let's pray.